delighted to have Jason Mazzoni. Close enough? Very good. Okay. Uh, we were having a discussion about who, who would be more likely to mispronounce the other person's name. <laughs> uh, Jason is uh, a professor at the Brooklyn Law School. In fact, he holds the Gerald Balin Professor of Law Position and has, is the youngest faculty member in the school's history that holds an endowed chair at the school, which is a quite an accomplishment. Uh, he did his BA degree at Harvard. He did his MA at Stanford, and then having had a little taste of the West Coast, went back to Harvard for his, uh, his law degree. His areas of expertise are in constitutional law, in intellectual property, and to some extent in legal history. He's practiced law in New York uh, as a counselor and attorney. Thank you. And uh, he also was a clerk for two federal judges. Where, 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 where did you look for the district circuit? Uh, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit in New York, uh, and then uh, the Southern District of New York, mm -hmm. the trial court. Great. Okay. Well, uh, the other thing is, is that he has a book that has just been published, I think last month. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, the, the title of the book is Copy Fraud and Other Abuses in Intellectual Property Law, which is the title of his talk for us today. So Jason, we're delighted to have you here with us. Looking forward to what you have to say. Great, thanks so much. Uh, and it's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, the book then that I wrote, I, I have some postcards, by the way, uh, anybody. <laughs> some people got them, but let me just, I guess, leave them somewhere to come to you. Uh, <laughs> uh, the book then is about overreaching uh, in intellectual property law. And this turns out to be a fairly complicated thing to wrestle with. Uh, but the basic idea that motivates the book uh, is at least fairly simple. Uh, so the law recognizes certain kinds of intellectual property, uh, and the law confers certain rights upon the owners uh, of that intellectual property. So the law, therefore, distinguishes between uh, what belongs to private uh, parties and what belongs to the public. Uh, so some works are not protected by intellectual property and are in the public domain free for anybody to use. And the works that are protected are protected in limited ways so that there are likewise boundaries between what is subject to control by a private party uh, and what is available to the public. Uh, in the most general sense, uh, overreaching occurs when a private party crosses the boundary and claims ownership of uh, something that belongs to the public, uh, or control of something that is available for the public to, uh, to use. So why should we care about this? Well, overreaching imposes economic costs. Uh, so when it's successful, uh, people pay out money uh, to do things that the law says can be done for free. Uh, overreaching also produces creative and expressive costs. So people uh, refrain uh, from uses of existing works, uh, refrain from creating uh, new works, or to put it in First Amendment terms, overreaching deters speech. So that's the basic idea. Uh, and the goal of the book then has been to look at uh, different areas of intellectual property law and in a variety of contexts uh, to understand the shape and form uh, that overreaching takes, uh, to see where it exists, uh, how it occurs, when it succeeds, and to identify when the costs of overreaching are sufficiently high that we should do something about it. So the book is both an effort thing to think about intellectual property law in general uh, from one perspective, uh, as well as an effort to look very specifically at different sectors and contexts uh, where it turns out uh, there's a <coughs> different variation. Now I should say at the outset uh, that I'm not somebody who thinks that protections for intellectual property are necessarily too strong, uh, or that they last too long, uh, or that there shouldn't be any intellectual property rights at all. Uh, there are people who take that uh, position. For the most part, I'm happy with uh, or agnostic about the scope of protections the law provides. 
Uh, my interest in the book uh, is to keep uh, rights within the boundaries that the legislature, uh, mostly Congress, has set. Uh, in preserving the bounds that Congress itself uh, has, uh, has uh, identified and created between private and public interest. Uh, the book covers a lot of ground and it considers different kinds of overreaching. Uh, one form of overreaching involves outright false claims to intellectual property, uh, in which there is an assertion of ownership of a property interest uh, and of the accompanying property rights uh, where, there is, where there is no legal basis for the claim of property. So claiming copyright in a public domain work, uh, what I refer to as <coughs> what I refer to as copy fraud uh, is the best example of this. Right, so here then uh, is the U.S. Constitution uh, with this copyright <laughs> notice uh, attached to it. Right? Uh, no part, maybe the producer can fit it. Uh, I actually have a whole collection of these things. So, uh, so here's, uh, here's a, a little one. Uh, so this publisher takes the position that uh, by, uh, uh, either by shrinking the Constitution, you obtain a copyright uh, in it. Uh, this one is... Um, uh, uh, copyright uh, uh, in the Constitution asserted in 2009 uh, by the National Center for Constitutional Rights. This one actually has an index, so I wonder, well, maybe that's the <laughs> basis for the copyright claim. But the index says things like uh, copyrights and patents, Congress's powers, Article 1, Section 8, which is the provision of the Constitution uh, that conferred powers on Congress to create copyright, but so not particularly original or uh, creative. And then finally, this one is the Declaration of Independence uh, and the Constitution uh, together. These were uh, copyrighted in 2003 by Georgetown University uh, Press. Um, <laughs> Publications of the U.S. government are in the public domain. Uh, so this is section 105 of the Copyright Act. It says copyright protection under this title is not available for any work of the United States government. Right? So all works of the United States government are in the public domain, not subject to copyright protection. But many publishers claim copyright ownership uh, when they reproduce and distribute governmental documents so Barnes & Noble has issued the Warren Commission Report, uh, 19, uh, 1964 uh, report, issued it in book form. It carries a copyright notice with uh, this warning, I know part of this book may be used or reproduced in any manner whatsoever without written permission of the publisher. This is a government report. Uh, the Barnes & Noble edition is literally, it's just a photocopy uh, of the original document. Barnes & Noble has no copyright uh, interest uh, in it. Um, I also brought along today uh, this volume. Uh, it's, uh, it's a volume that's published by B&A, which is a legal uh, publisher. Uh, it's called Patent, uh, Trademark, and Copyright Laws. Uh, as the title suggests, the only things in here are the texts uh, of the relevant legislation. The Patent Act, uh, the Trademark Statutory Provisions, uh, and then the Copyright Act. Nothing else. Uh, and yet we find uh, on, the, on the second page in a copyright notice, uh, copyrighted by BNA, all rights reserved, photocopy in any portion of this publication is strictly prohibited unless express written authorization is first obtained. Uh, and then it says authorization to photocopy items for internal or personal use is granted uh, provided that a dollar per page is paid. Uh, and then there's an address where you can send off your uh, And there's no sense of irony here because at page uh, 298 uh, available for a dollar is this uh, telling you that uh, 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 works are not in the public domain, not subject to uh, copyright uh, protection. Okay. Um, copyright is also often claimed after the term of copyright has expired. And so this is something you may have encountered. Uh, this is the Copyright Clearance Center. Uh, faculty members often uh, use this and may be familiar with it. Uh, others in the audience may know about this as well. This is a website. Uh, it's very convenient. Uh, it connects uh, people who wish to make use of copyrighted works with publishers. 
uh, you can go on to the side, uh, look up the title, uh, and uh, then you can obtain a license uh, to use uh, portions of the copyrighted work, uh, say, uh, in a course packet or for a presentation, or for some other purpose. So the site will give you uh, the relevant licensing fee. You edit your credit card information, or if you're in a university, the university probably has uh, an account. Uh, and uh, uh, you can purchase the license conveniently, uh, easily online. Well, a lot of the stuff that is available for licensing at the Copyright Clearance Center is actually in the public domain. Uh, so I did a recent search. Uh, there are more than two dozen editions of The Federalist uh, available for licensing, between 10 cents and a dollar per page. So you can find um, Joseph Story's commentaries on the Constitution, also in the public domain. Uh, Madison's notes from the Constitutional Convention, <laughs> numerous plays by Shakespeare, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, all available for licensing at various prices. Uh, this is oh, this is Blackstone's Commentaries on the Laws of England in the public domain, available for uh, 20 cents per page uh, from the Copyright uh, Clearance Center. Um, okay, uh, a few years ago, uh, Egypt. Uh, the Egyptian parliament was considering legislation that would copyright the pyramids. Um, <laughs> explaining the proposed law, uh, Zahi Hawass, uh, the head of Egypt's Supreme Council of Antiquities, said, uh, it is Egypt's right to be the only copyright owner for these monuments in order to benefit financially so we can restore, preserve, and protect Egyptian monuments. He said, the new law will completely prohibit the duplication of historic uh, Egyptian monuments, uh, which we consider 100% copies, right? So, uh, uh, pyramids <laughs> copyrighted by Egypt. Uh, this sounds less ridiculous when we consider some of our own practices with respect to public domain uh, works of art, museums, uh, and commercial services claim copyrights in images of public domain paintings that they market to the public. There is, however, no copyright uh, in a perfect uh, reproduction of a two-dimensional work of art, what's referred to as a slavish copy. Uh, the courts have said um, uh, producing an image, taking a photograph, uh, of a two-dimensional work of art might entail technical skill and hard work, but it doesn't, by definition, entail uh, sufficient creativity and originality, the grounds for granting copyright uh, protection. Uh, nonetheless, um, copyright uh, is routinely asserted in these kinds of images. Uh, so this is the uh, Bridgman Art Library. The Bridgman Art Library is one of the entities that has gone to court uh, to assert copyright uh, in uh, images of public domain paintings and markets to the public, uh, and it's lost, uh, the courts have ruled against it. Nonetheless, it continues to assert copyright uh, in reproduction of images of the Mona Lisa uh, and, other, uh, and other public domain uh, images. Uh, so then, uh, these are, uh, uh, so these are all claims to intellectual property where there is none, uh, no property interest at all. Overreaching occurs also uh, when owners of intellectual property, so people who do possess a copyright or some other kind of uh, intellectual property, misrepresent the nature uh, or exaggerate the scope uh, of the rights that they do possess. So they cross the divide between private and public interest, often in ways that would leave the public with nothing at all. Uh, so one example of this, uh, Barbie is protected by trademark law. Uh, but trademark law uh, does not prohibit taking photographs of Barbie, uh, say, under attack by household appliances. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> in a second. Um, uh, nonetheless, the tell suit this photographer uh, has brought other lawsuits against depictions of Barbie that Mattel considers objectionable or sometimes they said slanderous by inserting <laughs> phony trademark and copyright uh, claims. Meanwhile, uh, Richard Branson claims a monopoly on virginity. Uh, so uh, his lawyers go after anybody who used the word virgin in a product uh, or company name. Uh, I think the only thing they've let slide is extra virgin olive oil. Uh, but if you use virgin, uh, his lawyers will, uh, will, will come after you. Uh, copyright law protects uh, something called the right of first sale. This is section 109 of the Copyright Act. 
Uh, and what it says basically is that if you own uh, a lawful copy of a work such as this book, uh, once you're done with it, uh, you have the right uh, under the Copyright Act uh, to sell the book, give it away, lend it to somebody else. Right? And then this is true notwithstanding uh, the copyright owner's exclusive distribution rights uh, that are part of the bundle of rights uh, that a copyright protects. Right? So the copyright owner cannot prohibit you from selling the book, giving it away, lending it to somebody uh, else uh, if you are the lawful owner uh, of a copy of the book. Uh, this is why there is, of course, a uh, large secondary market uh, in, uh, in books and in other kinds of, 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 of works. Um, Sellers of content in digital form uh, deny this right, the right of first sale. So they deem their customers uh, to be subscribers or licensees, uh, and the works that they distribute to them uh, to be uh, licensed, uh, not sold. Right? So they say that because that's true, uh, you're not the owner uh, of the product that you, are, that you have received. You therefore cannot invoke uh, this protection of Section 109 can't transfer to anybody else uh, the thing that you have, uh, the thing that you have paid for. So what does this mean? Uh, well, it means that the books on your Kindle, uh, the music in your digital library, the software on your computer, uh, any electronic journal to which you uh, have subscribed, uh, all of these things are said to be owned not by you, uh, but by the uh, provider uh, or publisher of them. And uh, once you're done with them, uh, you can't uh, distribute them further. And by the way, you probably agreed to this in a contract, uh, and there are likely technological measures uh, that enforce the restriction. So uh, Adobe markets uh, eBooks, and uh, this is Adobe's version of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, and it comes with, when you purchase it uh, or uh, download it uh, from the Adobe site, uh, comes with a permissions page, and these are the restrictions that Adobe places on uh, the use of this book. Um, <laughs> now, the book is actually in the public domain, uh, but even if it were copyrighted, uh, copyright law does not prohibit uh, lending or giving a book to somebody else, uh, or reading aloud. <laughs> Uh, when Adobe was asked about this seemingly ridiculous uh, provision, it said, it doesn't sound like uh, what you think it sounds like. It actually means using the book in conjunction with a electronic text to uh, speech uh, uh, reader. Uh, and I guess the advice to Adobe is you should uh, do what the March Hare said and say what you mean. Uh, but nonetheless, these are the restrictions that uh, Adobe uh, uh, places on Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Uh, and we see similar kinds of restrictions on a variety of other digital content. It's not just the digital content uh, where we see uh, efforts by publishers or providers uh, to limit uh, this right of first sale that has traditionally been protected uh, and is written into the Copyright Act. Uh, so this is uh, this is Kathleen QMDR, which is a bar review course. So my students take this course, or many of them take the course, in order to prepare for the bar exam uh, after they graduate from uh, from law school. Uh, when they uh, sign up for Kathleen QMDR, costs thousands of dollars to sign up for the course. The students get a set of study materials, and big books, uh, printed books that they use in order to prepare for the bar uh, exam. Uh, Kaplan PMBR uh, tells you or tells the student that notwithstanding the amount of money that you pay, notwithstanding the fact that you received materials in, uh, in a printed form, uh, they're not yours. Right? So uh, you agree not to reproduce, redistribute, share, sell, auction, or give away any such materials, either during or after your enrollment. And if you do that, uh, you're going to be subject not just to civil penalties, but you're going to jail. Right? So uh, this is um, uh, an example, then, of an effort to extinguish uh, the right of first sale that's traditionally been protected. Uh, even with respect to printed materials. And it's not just bar review courses. If you look at uh, other companies that are providing study materials uh, in other sectors and industries, you'll see similar kinds of restrictions with respect to uh, printed materials that you uh, take. Right, so then these are examples of intellectual property rights 
of being stretched beyond uh, the limits that the law actually sets upon those rights. And distinguishing among different kinds of overreaching helps to explain why overreaching occurs uh, and why it's very often successful. Uh, meaning uh, the content providers or IP owners are able to enhance their rights, uh, stop uses that the law permits, <coughs> obtain monetary payments that the law does not require. And so the book traces and catalogs various causes of overreaching. And let me just mention a couple of things. Uh, in some contexts, the law itself uh, enables or facilitates overreaching. We see this with respect to false claims of copyright uh, in public domain works, uh, which I've already talked about uh, a little. So a basic defect of modern copyright law uh, is that statutory protections for copyright are not balanced with affirmative protections for the public domain. So Congress has enumerated the rights of copyright owners but it's left protections for the public domain largely dependent upon copyright owners respecting the limits on those enumerated rights. Uh, under these conditions, uh, copy fraud flourishes. So remedies for copyright infringement are severe, but the Copyright Act provides no civil remedy against publishers who improperly claim copyright over materials that are part of the public domain. Uh, there is this provision of the Copyright Act uh, that prohibits uh, fraudulent, uh, intentional uh, use of a copyright notice. Right? Uh, 17 U.S.C. Uh, Section 506 of the Copyright Act imposes a fine of $2,500. Uh, this is a criminal provision, uh, but it's never enforced. There are literally no cases on this. Penalty is only $2,500, so the government takes the position uh, evidently that it's not worth bringing uh, prosecutions for people who, uh, who do this, who violate this provision. Uh, $2,500 is such a minimal amount of money, uh, the existence of a possible criminal penalty does not act as much of a uh, deterrent. Uh, and as I said, in contrast to most of copyright law, uh, where you allow for uh, civil remedies, you allow private parties uh, to go into court uh, and, uh, uh, and uh, seek a remedy, this is only a criminal provision. So enforcement uh, depends uh, entirely uh, upon uh, the cooperation of the Department of Justice or the Attorney General. Is it a clarifying question? Well, so when copyright holders come to court and they try to support these uh, extended uses of copyright, what is the likelihood that the judge rules in their favor? So if you can hold that until later on, because it raises a variety of issues, some of which I'm going to cover in a moment. So um, I, I'll be happy to get to it. Um, uh, OK. Uh, other features of our system of copyright also uh, reflect a similar imbalance. Uh, between affirmative protections for copyright uh, and for the public domain. And so we have then a, uh, uh, the Federal Copyright Office, this is its home page, uh, it's responsible for registering a copyright <coughs> works, but there's no federally supported public domain office uh, that catalogs and collects uh, public domain titles where you can go to find out whether something is in the public domain. Uh, we have a symbol, this is a familiar copyright symbol, part of federal law, uh, to designate copyrighted works, but there is no uh, symbol uh, to designate uh, works that are in the public uh, domain. Uh, the Department of Justice, uh, the FBI, a variety of other federal agencies are responsible for uh, enforcing and protecting copyrights, but there's no federal agency uh, specifically charged uh, with protecting the public domain. So the end result is that copyright law itself creates an almost irresistible urge uh, for publishers and other content providers to claim ownership, however spurious, in everything. And we know threat of civil litigation uh, and little risk of criminal prosecution. Uh, there is an incentive to attach a copyright notice uh, to every kind of work, uh, whether it's copyrighted or not. So one of the remedies that the book offers uh, is to create some kind of private cause of action uh, that would uh, allow uh, for judgments against uh, these kinds of uh, uh, misuses of copyright notices. But there are a lot of other things that uh, we can do to rein in putting copyright claims. Uh, and the book offers a series of other proposals, uh, some of which I'd be happy to talk about um, in the, in the Q&A uh, at the end. 
overreaching also occurs because content providers are able to take advantage of the fact uh, that boundaries between uh, private rights and public access are not always visible to the public. Right? So private parties are able to extend out their rights by persuading people uh, that they own more than they do. Overreaching can succeed uh, because in response, individuals make conservative <coughs> uses of intellectual property, and even if individual users uh, recognize false uh, or exaggerated claims of intellectual property rights, they're often gatekeepers who stand in the way of lawful activity. Uh, so one example of this, a few years ago, uh, Disney purchased the screenplay for a movie, Wild Hogs, uh, did anybody <laughs> see it? And this is obviously a high brow. Uh, crowd. Uh, Wild Hogs is about a group of uh, middle-aged suburban men who turn bikers. Uh, and they travel around the country. Uh, and they encounter, this is according to the script, uh, they encounter a chapter uh, of the Hell's Angels. Well, the Hell's Angels Motorcycle Corporation uh, got wind of this and sued Disney and its distributors to stop production. The lawsuit contended uh, that by showing bikers who identify themselves uh, as members of the Hells Angels, the movie violated the Hells Angels Corporation's rights in its registered Hells Angels trademark. And in the screenplay, the protagonists are involved uh, in various confrontations uh, with members of the Hells Angels. And this, the Hells Angels Corporation said, uh, tarnished its wholesome trademark. Um, <laughs> We are a long way from the bounds of trademark law when there may be no movies uh, made with Hells Angels bikers unless the Hells Angels Corporation approves. Uh, but Disney caved uh, when Wild Hogs, you wouldn't know this because you've never seen it, uh, but when Wild Hogs was released in 2007, uh, no Hells Angels bikers are shown, so Disney replaces them with some other uh, gang. Right? And we, uh, uh, so, the, uh, so the Disney acts as a gatekeeper preventing the realization of the screenplay uh, as written. And we see similar kinds of mechanisms by gatekeepers in other uh, circumstances. I'd like to turn then to the issue of fair use, uh, because that's something that many of you in the room uh, have probably encountered or are likely to encounter. Uh, as you may know, uh, the fair use provision of the Copyright Act uh, permits certain uses of copyrighted works, uh, even without the permission of the copyright owner and without payment uh, to the copyright owner. Fair use is a defense to a claim of copyright uh, infringement. Uh, in writing the book on overreaching, fair use was the issue uh, that in some ways turned out to be the most difficult. Uh, it's difficult because it doesn't uh, fit perfectly with other kinds of overreaching where we can <coughs> say with a high degree of certainty that the claim that the content provider or the IP owner is making is not a claim that the law recognizes and protects. The problem with fair use uh, is that it's often hard for anybody to know uh, in advance uh, whether any particular use of a copyrighted work is fair. Right? So in other words, the boundary uh, between what is private and what is public can be uh, difficult to discern. Right? So it can be hard to say that the copyright owner is overreaching rather than just making a plausible argument under fair use law about the scope of his or her rights. I don't want to exaggerate the, uh, the, the difficulties. Uh, I've, uh, I serve on the board of trustees of the Copyright Society of the United States. Uh, and as a result, I'm on a lot of the panels. And I've been on a lot of panels about fair use law and its meaning and its application. Uh, and uh, the other panelists are lawyers and the members of the audience are lawyers, lawyers who represent uh, typically uh, uh, copyright owners. Uh, and questions have come up about particular uses. Is this fair? Is this not? Uh, and members of the audience and, the, and the people on the panel have said, yes, definitively, this is fair use. Oh, no, it's not fair use. Right, so, there, uh, so there are some areas uh, of agreement. Uh, but there are enough instances in which it's hard to predict whether a proposed use is fair that it becomes difficult to identify in general terms when the copyright owner is crossing the line and interfering with a specific use that is lawful. The flip side of the problem, though, and the thing that I focus in on uh, in the book, is that copyright owners routinely exploit the ambiguities of fair use law by claiming, in essence, that there is no such thing as fair use, that no use uh, of their work is ever fair, that every use of the copyrighted work must be licensed. 
So that level at least, uh, where you have uh, repeat players of a single copyright owner <coughs> whose position in practice uh, is that nothing is fair use, uh, we have, I think, overreaching, even if in particular instances and perhaps at the margins, uh, it can be hard to say uh, whether a proposed use is fair. Let me just back up a moment uh, and say, particularly for people who may not uh, work in this field or may not have encountered this before, uh, where the ambiguities of fair use come from. Uh, this is the provision of the Copyright Act uh, that protects fair use in Section 107 uh, of the uh, Copyright uh, Act. Uh, in writing this, which is part of the uh, 1976 <coughs> Copyright Act uh, uh, put into law by Congress, Congress wanted to write a fair use provision that would be sufficiently flexible that it could apply to a variety of circumstances, some of which Congress knew uh, it could not predict in advance. And so if you look at uh, how Congress wrote the statute, it's written in pretty broad terms. Uh, Congress gave us uh, a four-factor test Right, so to figure out whether a particular use is fair, uh, you look at uh, these four factors. They're not the only factors to consider, but these are ones that uh, should be included in the analysis. Uh, and if you look at any of these individual factors, you'll see that they're written pretty broadly. Right, so number three, uh, one of the factors is the amount and substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. But the statute doesn't tell us uh, what amount and how substantial uh, the portion has to be uh, before it's no longer fair use. Uh, and in addition, uh, you run into the problem that exists with any sort of multi-factor test. What happens if, say, one and two point to the conclusion that the use is fair, other uh, than three and four point to the conclusion that it's not fair? How do you balance those things against each other? The statute doesn't uh, tell us. Right, so uh, uh, the statutes, uh, uh, the statute is in such a general way, uh, without uh, very specific guidance. They could be very hard just by reading the statute to make a determination uh, about whether uh, your proposed use would be protected uh, fair use in this context. You only really know for sure uh, whether your use of a copyrighted work is fair or not uh, when a judge uh, applies the factors and issues a ruling. So this means that there is a body of case law. Uh, there are uh, judicial decisions applying these fair use factors. Um, but the case law also doesn't help too much in figuring out whether a future proposed use of copyrighted work would be fair. Because uh, while Congress wrote a very general statute, when you get to the judicial decisions, you encounter exactly the opposite problem. Uh, the courts, when they decide fair use disputes, uh, 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 decide a highly fact-specific question, right? asking whether uh, the use of this 10-page excerpt of this particular book uh, for this particular purpose is fair use or not uh, after application of the statute. And unless you fall within exactly the same factual scenario, it's very hard to generate uh, from uh, those decisions uh, more generalizable rules uh, that could guide you uh, in, the, uh, in the future. So in that context, uh, there is enough uncertainty that copyright owners are able to assert uh, that all uses must be licensed, uh, in other words, to interfere with any reliance upon fair use. And copyright owners can succeed uh, in these <coughs> claims because for the individual user, the person who is thinking about making fair use of a copyrighted work, the penalty uh, for guessing wrong and then facing the judgment, right, a decision that says, no, your use is not fair, it constitutes infringement of the copyrighted work. The penalty is so high uh, that it's uh, almost always preferable uh, just to pay a licensing fee or abandon the use that you wanted to make. Uh, and even if the individual user is less risk averse, and I'm willing to go to court, defend my fair use claim, uh, suffer whatever consequence uh, comes down, uh, there are, again, often risk averse gatekeepers who will adhere to the position that the copyright owners adopt, uh, publishers, insurers, distributors, and so on, uh, who are not willing to run uh, the risk, uh, even if the individual author or artist or uh, creator uh, uh, would be willing to, uh, to run the risk. Increasingly, also, access to a work is conditioned upon waiving, giving up, uh, any right of fair use. This is particularly true with respect to works that are delivered in digital form. 
right? But it's also true when you visit an archive and you sign an agreement that says, I won't quote anything uh, from the materials in your collection without your permission. And so the book describes then how licensing has really replaced uh, fair use. In book publishing, uh, there is a prevailing norm uh, that all uses of copyrighted works must be licensed. Uh, if you are an author, uh, the publisher who owns the copyright in something that you would like to excerpt or reproduce in your book, I uh, will tell you that the use must be approved uh, and often paid for. And your own publisher will say the same thing. The production won't proceed uh, until you can show the sign form. Uh, and as an author, uh, you will have signed uh, an agreement, a uh, contract indemnifying your publisher for any copyright infringement claim, a provision that says, if you publish or are sued, uh, I will be the one who will defend you and pay any judgment for infringement. So under these circumstances, you have tremendous pressures uh, to license. The leading fair use to the licensing market uh, isn't desirable because we're not meant to be paying for fair use. Uh, and fair use uh, is meant to protect criticism, parodies, uh, other uses that copyright owners just won't authorize. Um, these dynamics with respect to fair use are particularly acute with respect to the music industry. Uh, and so I thought I would say uh, something about, uh, about that. Uh, in the music industry, uh, or according to the music industry, uh, there is no fair use. Uh, so let's think about sampling. Virtually all samples from prior recordings are licensed. Uh, with few exceptions, you cannot distribute a recording on a major label or via mainstream distribution channels uh, that samples from earlier works unless those samples have been cleared. And a particular reason for this um, uh, 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 is a decision, it was in 2005, that came out of the US Court of Appeals, the Sixth Circuit, so this is a court that is uh, one level below the US Supreme Court, uh, in a case called Bridgeport Music versus Dimension Films. Uh, the case involved the use of the sample uh, from uh, a George Clinton uh, recording. George Clinton is the uh, most uh, the sampled artist of all time. Uh, and the question in the case uh, was whether this use of the sample uh, was lawful or not under the Copyright Act. Uh, the circuit court, which is the appellate court, uh, issued a uh, decision uh, in which it said, uh, get a license or do not sample. It doesn't sound very judicial, but that was actually what the, the court said in the case. And this has really become the slogan for the music industry with respect to sampling. Um, the problem with the case, and I don't want to get too much into the technical details of it, uh, except to say that the problem with the decision uh, from the appellate court is that it said this, get a license or do not sample, without ever deciding uh, whether sampling, uh, in this case or generally, is protected by fair use. The reason for that was that the lower court, the trial court, had based its decision on a different legal doctrine. Uh, there's a doctrine called uh, the de minimis doctrine, uh, which courts have used. Uh, and it says, basically, some kinds of copying are so trivial, so minimal, uh, that we don't even have to ask about fair use. Uh, this is just not something that the Copyright Act uh, concerns itself with. Uh, and uh, the lower court had uh, ruled that, in this case, where you're only talking about a couple of seconds of the use of the George Clinton uh, tune, uh, but that was uh, minimal, uh, de minimis, uh, and so uh, uh, was not uh, infringement. Uh, when the case went up on appeal uh, to the circuit court, the circuit court reversed, uh, said this is not uh, de minimis, you can't uh, rule on that basis, uh, and then sent it back down to the lower court, uh, for the lower court to ask uh, whether the sample at issue was protected by fair use, to conduct that analysis in the first instance. Before that happened, however, the case settled. Right? And so neither the district court nor the appellate court uh, ever issued a ruling uh, on whether uh, fair use protected the sample of uh, an issue uh, in, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the case. Uh, and so, and there haven't been any other judicial decisions on uh, the question of fair use and sampling. Um, uh, and uh, nobody who uh, is sampling uh, wants to be the guinea pig who goes to court. Uh, and even though there's a significant amount of off-label sampling that occurs, the record labels, uh, and here I'm thinking uh, in particular about uh, Girl Talk and uh, why he's never been sued, uh, the record labels uh, seem to take the position 
uh, that it's in their interest to tolerate uh, some uh, exceptional, some uh, uh, some uh, amount of sampling, uh, because the alternative is to sue somebody like Fred Gillis going to court and run the risk uh, of a decision by a court about what he's doing, at least in some circumstances, is uh, protected fair use uh, by application of these statutory uh, provisions. So the industry is better off in the world in which they can assert uh, the language from the earlier decision that I told you about, get a license or do not sample, uh, and avoid uh, any uh, uh, any uh, ruling uh, in a case, say, that's girl talk, uh, in which a court would say, no, actually, some sampling is protected uh, fair use and is uh, is permissible. So uh, in, in those circumstances, uh, they, uh, I think this explains why uh, they haven't sued him uh, in particular. Uh, OK, uh, let me uh, just say a couple more things and then uh, open it up. Um, you might be wondering, well, how can we fix uh, fair use? Uh, I have a number of proposals in the book. Uh, fair use is a complicated topic. Uh, but with respect to the issue of uh, music and fair use uh, and sampling, uh, there are a couple of possibilities. Uh, one is we can ask Congress to write into uh, the fair use provision of the Copyright Act uh, some uh, more specific provision that, that tells us uh, when, whether and when uh, sampling uh, is, uh, is permitted. Right? So to give some specificity to this very genuinely written uh, statutory provision. Uh, another option uh, would be to have Congress uh, create a system of what we call compulsory licensing. The compulsory licensing exists in other areas, uh, particularly with respect to music. What it does uh, is, as a matter of statute, uh, it says uh, you can use this copyrighted work, uh, but you have to pay the copyright owner a set fee. Copyright owner can't say no. The fee is set uh, by some administrative body. You want to make use, uh, you pay for it, uh, and, and, and that's that. Uh, you could have something like that uh, in the sampling context as well. Uh, it's not a perfect solution because uh, fair use is supposed to be free use, but it might be preferable to the situation that we have uh, today. We could also wait for a court decision uh, on the meaning uh, of sampling and fair use. Uh, but again, the courts are not typically or haven't typically been a good place to issue rulings that give uh, sufficient clarity to guide people in the future about what fair use, uh, what fair use uh, protects. Uh, protects. Uh, right now, everyone seems to, in the industry, uh, to adhere to this uh, position of the, uh, of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit, get a license or do not sample, even though the case was not, as I said, uh, a fair use uh, case. So money is paid out. Uh, when perhaps it shouldn't be. A sampling is less common, even though it's easier uh, than ever before uh, because of the availability of technology. Uh, and uh, so let me uh, uh, finish up then by, uh, by uh, showing you uh, some uh, related materials that uh, demonstrate uh, the industry's position on the effect of, uh, on, the, uh, on the meaning of fair use. Uh, or the meaning of copyright law uh, in the music industry. And I know a number of people uh, in this building are interested in the issues of education, so I thought that this would be uh, a, good, uh, a good example. Uh, so the Recording Industry Association of America has uh, put together uh, a curriculum uh, for teachers to instruct students. We're going to see things from the elementary school program teaches to instruct students about the meaning of copyright. Uh, and it's called uh, Music Rules. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at what they uh, had to say about music and copyright. <laughs> this is a poster uh, that uh, teachers are supposed to put out in the classroom. They never copy someone else's created work without permission from the copyright holder. It's not an accurate uh, statement of the law. Uh, fair use protects uh, some copying, uh, and other provisions of the Copyright Act also don't require permission before copying. Uh, but as we'll see, as we see here, uh, and in the next couple of slides, uh, the industry denies outright uh, any availability of fair use. Uh, this is um, an activity sheet, so this is something that uh, teachers are supposed to ask uh, their students in elementary school to. Uh, to, to do as part of the curriculum, uh, and this is what I wanted to focus on, and some kids and even some grown-ups. Uh, don't get the music the right way. There's song lifters, people who take songs without paying for them. Uh, some song lifters copy music from other people's CDs, uh, some use the internet. Either way, song lifting is like shoplifting, and that means it's wrong. 
Uh, well, of course, uh, uh, some copying is protected by fair use. Uh, and there's a lot of music that is actually available uh, on the internet and elsewhere because artists make it uh, available because they want people to use it. Uh, and under those circumstances, uh, it's not like shoplifting and it's not, uh, and it's not wrong. Uh, oh, I wanted to yeah, zero in on this part of the, of the activity sheet. Because uh, here uh, is an exercise part to find out if someone is being the real problem in your community. Use this chart to interview <laughs> family members and friends about where they get their music, right, and then bring the data back to class. Use your data to figure out how much someone's being a person with people you know, right, and then you can fill it sounds a bit like something out of the old East Germany, you know, where you're spying on your family and then reporting them. Uh, I, looked at the, uh, I looked at the teacher's manual that accompanies this, uh, and it says uh, to the teachers, maybe they shouldn't really be collecting names. Uh, but uh, this is, this is an activity. Uh, and then we get this one. So here we go. Uh, it's the law. So let's see the law according to the Recording Industry Association of America. Um, uh, this is a reminder that music recordings are protected by copyright. It's illegal for anyone to make a copy of that recording without permission from the people who created it, not so in all circumstances. But then they generalize the same thing with respect to other sorts of intellectual property. Then they make it personal, right? Uh, your own drawings and writings are protected by copyright. They are your intellectual property. You made up out of your ideas. And no one has the right to make copies without your permission. Get outright denial, absolute denial of any availability of, uh, of fair use. Um, lately, I've been watching episodes of Sesame Street. <laughs> uh, and just recently, I came across an episode that I thought I captured almost perfectly uh, the basic theme, of, uh, basic theme of my book. Uh, the episode involves a popular Sesame Street character, uh, Ernie. Uh, it's short for Ernest, a fitting name for reasons that will become apparent uh, in a moment. You probably know uh, Ernest. He's a youthful man with a round face uh, who wears striped sweaters. Uh, he has a domestic living arrangement with an older gentleman uh, <laughs> uh, Bert, uh, but that's not relevant to the plot in any way. It's in New York in the 70s. Uh, Ernie, Ernest, in the episode uh, that I was watching, encounters a salesman called Lefty. Right, he's wearing a trench coat, uh, which he opens up to reveal the letter O. Uh, Lefty wants to sell the O to Ernest. Lefty tells Ernest that he has to buy the O in order to make the words olive, ostrich, ocean, and old. Uh, and he needs uh, to buy the O. He wants to sing a song with the refrain, O, O, O. <laughs> now, the O costs just a nickel. Right? So it doesn't seem like much. And it certainly looks very useful, all the things that Ernie could do with this letter O. Yeah. But of course, Ernie doesn't need to pay a nickel to make those words or to sing that song. Uh, but Lefty counts on him not knowing better. And he counts on the fact that if he later finds out that he's been duped, uh, there's probably uh, nothing he can do about it, or at least it's too much trouble. Uh, Ernest does not appear uh, to be represented by uh, counsel. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, uh, all of those nickels are uh, spent because people think Lefty really does own the letter O. Well, uh, they, uh, they add up. Uh, so I thought that was a sort of uh, um, a, a way of uh, thinking uh, about the, the basic theme of the, the, the book. I thank you for listening. I'd be happy to uh, hear uh, at least favorable comments and questions. <laughs> So go for it. Okay. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering uh, if you talk a little bit about the role of money in kind of I said the role of the role money. of money, money in relation to uh, kind of navigating these cases, especially because uh, in terms of fair use, especially. Uh, on the case of like a general user who doesn't have access to counsel, et cetera, et cetera, um, and the penchant to settle cases rather than moving them to court, like what is the future going to look like? Great, and so this actually comes back to the earlier question about, well, when, when, when this gets before a judge, how is it that you can continue to assert these sort of phony claims, uh, either with respect to public domain works or with respect to uh, interference with fair use? Uh, and it's an important point, because the vast majority uh, of these disputes 
are resolved privately without any uh, judge uh, ever making a determination uh, with respect to the claims that are being asserted. The very reasons that you just identified. Uh, if you are sued uh, for copyright infringement, uh, there are enormous pressures not to go forward and defend yourself. Uh, copyright infringement cases are enormously expensive uh, to litigate. Uh, and uh, even if the risk is small, the potential penalties are very large. Uh, and so uh, with respect to fair use, which you asked about, the result uh, is that we have uh, uh, relatively few judicial decisions on the meaning of fair use. We had a lot more uh, than we could perhaps uh, have a coherent body of cases that would provide more general rules. But most uh, fair use uh, disputes are never resolved in court. Uh, they are resolved uh, through private settlement, uh, mostly, uh, most of the time involving uh, uh, a copyright owner uh, threatening to bring a lawsuit uh, and uh, the individual user backing down uh, because it simply is not worth the hassle or expense uh, and you probably don't have the resources uh, to go to court. Uh, and so uh, fair use then uh, uh, is, is really not uh, uh, to any uh, significant degree uh, something that is determined uh, by courts. Uh, fair use cases uh, fair use disputes are not adjudicated by courts. Uh, the rules of fair use, uh, therefore, are set by private parties. Uh, and this, I think, is a problem because uh, it does uh, both undermine uh, the availability of using fair use because the settlements al almost always involve a much more restrictive um, uh, understanding of fair use than, uh, than uh, it is one that uh, is part of the Copyright Act. Uh, and it also means we don't get uh, judicial decisions uh, that would help clarify some of this uh, in a way that I think would be helpful for additional users. So, uh, and it's a general trend, not just uh, uh, not just with respect to fair use, but with respect to copyright law uh, in general. A lot of this stuff, a lot of the meaning of law, is not determined by courts. Uh, it's determined through uh, interactions between copyright owners, often well-heeled copyright owners, uh, and uh, individuals who are not typically in a good position uh, to uh, just to stand up. Do, do other countries do a better job at sort of maintaining um, a database or offerings of this is what the public domain is, this is clear, are other countries better? And how can, not to compare, but what, what yeah. how can you steal those approaches? <laughs> yeah, um, on that specific... Make fair use of them. <laughs> so, I mean, on that specific question about whether there are databases, um, I haven't seen any, but that doesn't mean there, uh, there aren't any. Um, so I don't know exactly. Um, I do know, uh, uh, though this is a related uh, uh, answer, I guess, to your question, uh, that uh, in some countries, uh, fair use is handled in a different way. Uh, and of particular interest is what Israel has done. So Israel recently enacted a new, uh, new copyright law. Uh, and as part of the statute, uh, Israel uh, simply copied the four factors from the US copyright uh, statutory provision. Uh, but uh, given uh, uh, that country's recognition, uh, of the problem of the vagueness of the statute uh, and the difficulties of relying upon courts uh, to give uh, more specific details about the meaning of the statute, uh, there is an additional provision written into the Israeli the statute that says that the Ministry of Justice is responsible uh, for issuing regulations uh, that would spell out uh, with additional clarity what this statutory provision means. And we don't know exactly how it's going to play out in Israel. It's still, uh, it's still relatively new. Uh, but there they have to turn over things to an administrative agency, the uh, Ministry of Justice, uh, to provide clarity uh, in recognition of the problems uh, that exist uh, on that uh, on that point uh, under the American law. So uh, that's an example of borrowing our system from our system, uh, modifying it. Uh, and I think there is perhaps a useful lesson uh, there. Um, uh, we might think about perhaps a greater role for an administrative agency uh, in this uh, in this context. Uh, there would be a question about which agency would do it. A copyright office might not be the best choice. Uh, but that is one kind of approach that might bring clarity. 
story to Becca Wild Hogs. Yeah. Did when the, when the script was submitted to Disney, didn't their lawyers go over the script and don't they don't they have? Well, I know a friend of mine is a lawyer for yeah. for DreamWorks. Yeah. And that's what she does. Yeah. But shouldn't they have, they did they catch it then that uh, the thing with the Hell's, Hell's Angels? Hell's um, as I understand it, they were happy to proceed. They didn't think that um, the, the inclusion of characters. Um, uh, uh, representing Hells Angel, Angel Bikers violated any intellectual property rights of the corporation. It was only at the point at which they were uh, contacted by the corporation, Hells Angels, uh, that they uh, uh, decided not to not to press the claim. And of course, in the lessons, this is Disney, which is in a position to uh, defend itself. Mm -hmm. right? Really, right. it is lawyers really think uh, that this is a problem, but you don't want to hold up release of the movie, and you might lose, and there might be damages, and so on. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the gatekeepers, the uh, attorneys, uh, uh, are able uh, to uh, to uh, to stand in the way. Uh, even in that context, we're not talking about an individual without uh, resources. Disney case. Jackie over here? Yes. So in the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, there's an anti-circumvention provision such that even if you're aware that you have fair use rights, you're not able to break through the encryption in order yes. to even use that. That's so true. Do you have any solutions or proposals for this problem? Um, well, so, uh, so, so, so you're right uh, that, uh, so we're talking about works that are in digital form and that are encrypted uh, or otherwise uh, protected by uh, access control technology. Uh, and, um, uh, and the difficulty, as you identify, uh, is that even uh, if you want to make fair use of the work, um, getting access to it, breaking the encryption uh, or circumventing the access control is itself unlawful and will subject you to a lawsuit. Uh, and so this has been a this has been a, a problem. It's been a problem, particularly with respect to uh, classroom uses. If you want to, uh, you know, queue up uh, uh, a DVD, for example, uh, uh, that can be uh, that that can be something that would require some invention uh, in a way that would be unlawful. Uh, but it exists in lots of other contexts uh, as well. Um, I mean, the remedy uh, is to uh, amend the DMCA to allow circumvention for purposes of fair use. The likelihood of that happening uh, is minimal. Um, the uh, Library of Congress, uh, which is an administrative agency, a congressional agency, has authority under the DMCA uh, to issue uh, exemptions uh, with respect to the access control uh, provisions with respect to certain classes of work. So they have some authority to grant exemptions. Uh, they've never granted a wholesale uh, exemption in order to access uh, fair use. Uh, so the more uh, sort of the more pernicious problem uh, is that these technological restrictions uh, can even prevent access to public domain works because you can have uh, public domain works uh, that are uh, part of uh, or that come with uh, certain copyrighted materials. Uh, you can't even circumvent them just to get the public domain work uh, because that also is uh, unlawful. So, uh, so you're right, it's a serious problem. Uh, it's a problem that um, uh, that is increasingly important uh, because this is the way that information is increasingly received. So uh, technological controls uh, are being used uh, to uh, prevent the uses of copyrighted works. Uh, the only way around it uh, is, uh, uh, it, it is a change in the statute. Can you, Stephen, here in the back, and then the gentleman over to him, and then that will probably be our last question. Oh, uh, thank you for a wonderful and fascinating presentation. Thank you. Um, uh, my particular question has to do with, uh, well, sampling and uh, as a form of cultural criticism. Uh, and uh, let's take sampling from music into the realm of digital art. Three very quick examples I'd like your response. One is a famous painting by Marcel Duchamp, uh, I believe it was 1919. It was a reproduction of the Mona Lisa with a mustache painted on the Mona Lisa and a title added to the bottom, L-H-O-O-Q. Um, and in that particular case, the Louvre, which presumably owns the copyright to photograph the Mona Lisa, uh, does it own Marcel Duchamp, or do, would they? I'll uh, probably say this is a while back. Yeah. Uh, but the mustache pre, uh, was a comment by Duchamp on the cult of art and all kinds of things. Uh, there's a second case. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> so, uh, so the copyright claim. Uh, I'm not sure what the basis of that is in the Mona Lisa, but that would be my first question. Um, is it not in the public domain? 
Well, I, I think the painting is, but the photographs of the painting are, are a different thing. I, is this under French law? I, 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 I right. So it becomes complicated. <laughs> uh, but I can give you the answer under US law, which is that the photograph would not be copyrighted. Uh, the courts have said that if you take a uh, perfect reproduction uh, of a two-dimensional artwork, uh, despite the technical skill involved in the setup and lighting and so on, uh, it might take you a long time to do it. That's not something that deserves copyright protection. All right. Uh, so, uh, so then when we get to the uh, modification, uh, the modifications might be subject to copyright protection, right? So the mustache and other elements uh, could be sufficiently creative and original. So if somebody else goes uh, later, does exactly the same thing, uh, there might be a claim for copyright infringement. Not because the Mona Lisa is protected, and again, I'm talking under American law, uh, but because those elements uh, that have been added to the public domain work, uh, if, again, if it's sufficiently original and creative, uh, that could give rise to an independent claim of copyright. Okay, well, the cultural criticism, uh, there, there was a movie made a while back by uh, Karen Carpenter, uh, the uh, singer who died of anorexia, yeah. and it uh, w used her music over photographs or images of Barbie dolls. <laughs> and that movie was never released. Uh, they were tied up, and I guess they just decided, I never got to see it, and I always wanted to. Uh, couldn't that be considered a legitimate cultural criticism? Uh, what, and then lastly, uh, Disney, uh, there used to be an underground comic character called Mickey Rat, and the big creators of that were sued uh, by Disney. Uh, uh, but Mickey Mouse, uh, uh, the copyright on, uh, on, on, I was in a trademark? I mean, uh, Disney is, has such a big legal division that nobody can oppose them. So given the amount of legal uh, muscle uh, brought to bear by corporations like Disney, uh, is there any recourse for people who want to engage in cultural criticism? You, I mean, legislative re remedies, you, uh, the courts don't sol solve the problem, and legislative re remedies seem to be stymied. So what do we do? Yeah, I mean, this is the problem. The, um, uh, in both instances, uh, you're talking about possible reliance upon fair use uh, uh, of these works, or as you say, criticism is one of the things that, uh, that fair use is designed to protect. Um, but if you're in the world of fair use, you're in a world of great uncertainty. Uh, and if there are uh, uh, distributors or others who uh, uh, that you depend upon or insurers that you depend upon, they're going to take a very narrow view of what fair use allows and probably cautiously use. the uh, use. As an individual, um, you might go ahead, uh, but there's always the risk that you're going to be targeting their own suit. Uh, it might not happen. They might leave you alone if they don't think what you're doing is very important, if they don't want to bring attention to what you're doing. Um, but at least the two examples from scratch seem to be sufficiently high profile that it would, that it would come as no surprise that those are uses that uh, copyright owners, Disney or whoever else, uh, would go after. Uh, and there is very little that can be done. Um, uh, unless you find, say, uh, uh, a lawyer who's willing to represent you for free uh, and go to court and defend this, unless perhaps you're judgment proof, meaning you have no money anyway, so, uh, so, uh, so any judgment if they're not going to be able to collect. Uh, but these are tremendous risks uh, and, and, and costly uh, endeavors, and this is, this is where we are. Okay. Our last question. I wanted to ask you about, there are people who worked in Kinko's and librarians who are scared to death. You've just written a book of how many pages people are allowed to copy of your book, of the, whether they're even allowed to copy it at all. And these people are terrified. I can go in and bring something. Oh, we can't copy this. What's the situation? Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. Again, so this is a gatekeeper uh, uh, that prevents you from going forward with something that you might <coughs> really think is fair use. Uh, well, um, with respect to Kinko's uh, in particular, um, there were some lawsuits uh, against New York University uh, and at the University of Michigan uh, that really made universities uh, very concerned about reliance upon fair use uh, to really clamp down on what, uh, on what faculty members were doing, for example. Uh, and uh, Kinko's or other coffee shops uh, do, as you say, uh, impose uh, a very high standards. Uh, Kinko's, you have, I uh, to bring with me, there is a permission form that you have to uh, you have to hand over to the Kinko's employee. Uh, uh, and they even allow you to fax it for free to the copyright owner to get the permission. Uh, during the course of writing the book, um, <coughs> I took to Kinko's uh, a, a play by uh, Shakespeare uh, and said, I'd like to make five copies of, of this. Could you please just photocopy it for me? And they, they handed me the form and said, you have to ask the copyright owner. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 but that's where we are. Right? Um, uh, so this is you know, the case of Kinko's coffee shop. These things exist in universities and, and elsewhere. Uh, they can stand in the way of 
uh, even more for copying. And is there a question that I can uh, make photocopies of a version of Venice, uh, but uh, not according to Kinko, so uh, hard to do it. Next week, our speaker is Ellen Wartella from Northwestern University, and her title is Food Marketing and the Childhood Obesity Crisis. So come and join us next week, and would you join me in thanking Jason?